the week. Okay, today I'm talking about Elizabeth Diggle's journal of a tour from London to the Highlands of Scotland, 19th April to 7th August, 1788. All the world is traveling to Scotland and Ireland, wrote Elizabeth Diggle on 7th July, 1788, near the end of the Scottish tour, which is the subject of my talk. Diggle was writing at Gretna Green, a point of entry for tourists to Scotland, as well as Ireland via Dumfries and Port Patrick. The rise of the home tour in the last two decades of the 18th century saw the beginnings of a substantial tourist presence in Scotland, many of whom members of the newly affluent middle classes with money and leisure time on their hands. After the start of the revolutionary Napoleonic Wars in 1793, closure of Europe further increased the popularity of the Scottish tour. It's a bit like, I guess, the post-Brexit and uh, COVID era staycation um, um, uh, of the present. present. Best-selling publications by earlier 18th century philosophical travelers like Thomas Pennant and Dr. Johnson had popularized two uh, principal um, tourist routes, which were known as the Petty and the Long Tour of Scotland. And they're shown here on, this, on the map that's published in the Old Ways New Road um, um, book done by uh, Alex Dean, um, my RA, which shows you um, uh, Dr. Johnson and, and Boswell's itinerary, the long tour, and a short petty tour um, based on um, William Gilpin's uh, tour of 1776. Vicky Coltman's talk earlier in, in this series highlighted a pedestrian tour by the Cambridge academic, Dr. Joseph Plumtree around 1799 who kept an unusually detailed record of both his travels and his accoutrements, or knickknacks, as he called them. The rise of picturesque tourism, popularized by another uh, English vicar, uh, the Reverend William Gilpin, also made the tour newly attractive to middle-class women in search of sublime scenery in the lakes and the Celtic peripheries, including the Scottish Highlands. Landscape sketching, as well as diary keeping and letter writing, were expected accomplishments of socially privileged women in the 18th century, many of whom lacked the antiquarian historical or natural historical education of men like Pennant or Plumtree. Although only four women actually published uh, Scottish tours in the period 1770 to 1830, Betty Hugland has listed 36 manuscript tours written by women in the same period, and that's certainly an underestimate, especially if one considers numerous tours described in women's letters and diaries that are not exclusively focused on travel. Elizabeth Diggle's um, journal is a 128 page manuscript notebook held in Glasgow University's library special collections as MS Gen 738 and that's really one of the main reasons I'm um, it's a wonderful tour but it's one of the main reasons I have chosen to speak about it today. It's a fair copy of 32 letters which the author sent home to her family during a protracted 14-week tour to Scotland in spring summer of 1789 before she joined them at their holiday residence at Margate at the end of her travels. Some of the letters actually respond to correspondence which Diggle picked up en route in Edinburgh, Aberdeen or Glasgow. She'd pick them up these letters from her family at post offices. So there's a kind of interactive quality to the correspondence. Though the early and later letter letters describe her journey through England to and from Scotland, uh, the Scottish letters which are my focus are numbered eight to 23, comprising about two thirds of the whole journal. As we'll see, there was an element of serendipity rather than advanced planning in Diggle's Scottish tour. The model itinerary she included at the end of her journal therefore represents an idealized version of what I call the clockwise petty tour of Scotland, which loops north and west from Glasgow via the military roads through Argyll and Perthshire before returning by a Fife to Edinburgh. And that actually reverses the course of the tour she took, she actually took. At the end of her journal, she also included a fascinating list of all the stages on her tour with distances traveled between each stop and a trip advisor, a style commentary on each of the inns she'd stayed in. So the inn at Lusk was very bad, whereas the new inn at Arachur was very good. Although um, Diggle's tour has never been digitized or fully transcribed, um, and that's it, that's the, you can see the be her beautiful handwriting. Um, uh, this is the, the, the original in the uh, uh, special collections in Glasgow. Um, the Scottish sections are included in Alistair Dury's excellent anthology, Travels in Scotland, published by the Scottish Historical Society in 2012. I'll go back to, to look at, um, so we can look at the actual manuscript for a minute. Little is known about Elizabeth Diggle, except that she lived in the seaside town, seaside town of Broadstairs in Kent and was an affluent middle-aged single woman. Middle-class by birth, she was well-connected with the gentry and carried letters of introduction to some of the great and the good in both England and Scotland. Touring offered Georgian women freedom from the restrictions of matrimony or domestic life 
And it's interesting how many of the surviving tours of this period are the work of widows, childless women, or divorcees. In this respect, Diggle resembles Dorothy Wordsworth, Sarah Murray Aust, Elizabeth Spence, and Sarah Hazlitt, and they stood out. Diggle traveled in a covered chase accompanied by her elderly aunt, driven by her coachman, Joseph. Teams of horses were hired and replaced at coaching inns en route, uh, although this wasn't, didn't prove possible in the West Highlands. Diggle doesn't tell us much about her traveling knickknacks like, uh, like Plumtree or Sarah Murray, although the gentleman at Carlisle at the end of her tour admired the travel-worthy nature of her vehicle, which is as worn and battered as its occupants. My hat is faded to pieces, my coat pinched, inked, and the carriage all faded, Joseph's jacket turned into a brown one, and so we make as shabby a figure as need be. Unlike Hester Piozzi, who toured Scotland a year after Diggle, or Sarah Murray of Kensington, indomitable author of the best-selling Companion and Useful Guide to Scotland of 1799, Diggle wasn't especially interested in picturesque descriptions of Scottish scenery, although she did describe sketching at Loch Leven Castle. However, her tour is distinguished in her own words by the exactness and prolixity of its account of Scottish people and places, even if she felt she'd met her match in James Boswell, whose journal of a tour to the Hebrides she consulted at Hamilton on the return lap of her tour. Assessing a traveler's motives for undertaking a tour provides important insight into the experiences they describe. Although Elizabeth Diggle was enjoying an extended holiday in Scotland, the main pretext for her visit was to attend a family wedding at Merthley Castle in Perthshire, and Merthley provide, provided a tourist base for the first half of a Scottish sojourn. Although frustratingly she provides only initials rather than names, my research suggests that she was a guest of Sir John Stuart, 16th Laird of Grantully and 4th Baronet of Merthley and Blair, and his dates were 1726 to 1797, whose daughter Grizzle married Reverend William Buckle, the rector of Purton near Oxford around this time. I conjecture, and it's only a conjecture, that he might have been related to Elizabeth Diggle. This wedding exemplifies the high rate of intermarriage between members of the Scottish here Highland gentry and nobility and the English upper or middle classes in this period of, which has been called a period of cons consolidating Britishness. Facilitated by the fact that the Stuarts of Grantelli were Episcopalians with strong Jacobite uh, lineage rather than Presbyterians. However, it would be, um, Sir John Stuart's grandson, Sir William Drummond Stuart, 1795 to 1871, who really put the family on the map as a celebrity adventurer in the Rocky Mountains. As a precursor of Brokeback Mountain, Drummond Stuart entered into a decade long same sex relationship with Antoine Clement, a French Canadian Cree hunter, with whom he returned to reside at Merthley, along with a herd of exotic bison. It's great, you can make it up. It's another story, and we'll hear more about this, I suspect, from Mungo Campbell who is, I believe, planning a future Hunterian ex exhibition on this fascinating figure and his art collection. Time only permits a few highlights of Diggle's tour, but I'll start with her very characteristic first impression of Scotland. At Dunbar, she describes women without shoes and stockings or hats uh, and, or bonnets, giving one in the latter respect an idea of France. And that comparison of Scotland to France is very common amongst English tourists of this period. It feels, it feels, in other words, it feels very foreign. After putting up at Walker's Hotel in Edinburgh, the party toured the sites of this, what she calls the finest city in Europe, especially Holyrood Palace, where she indulged her interest in Mary Queen of Scots, as well as visiting the uh, Botanic uh, Gardens, which were then in, on Leith Walk, um, as you can see here from Jacob Moore's um, image of, um, in, from 1771. They also visited the Natural History Museum of, in the college through the politeness of Dr. John Walker. After dining with a banker, Sir William Forbes of Putslago and attending the theatre, Diggle wrote to his sister, uh, charmingly, I'm as stupid as an owl, and I'll tell you why. I've seen so many new people and things within this week that they're all in my head pell-mell, a castle upon a lady of quality, and a scotch bonnet upon a church, etc., etc. The young ladies here in general draw and paint, and I'm much accomplished. They all have fine teeth and are taller than you and I. Setting off for, um, for Merthley uh, via Kinross and Perth, they arrived at 15th century Merthley Castle around 18th um, May, where they joined the prenuptial house party, quite in the style of ancient hospitality, she wrote, before inns were invented. Diggle boasted that she'd gained great credit for her real dancing in the evenings after rambling in the beautiful grounds during the day. Around uh, the 19th of May, they visited um, 
beauty spots along the River Brown, where Sir John Stuart's estates bordered those of the Duke of Athol. And here Diggle, Diggle gave a memorable um, description of her visit to the Duke of Athol's Ossian's Hall near Dunkeld. And this was an absolute must-see of the uh, Highland tour in this period. Um, this is John Simon's uh, drawing a plan of it from 1806. It is called a hermitage, Diggle wrote, but has more resemblance to a fairy palace. The entrance is by a rude Gothic porch, a painting of the blind bowed Ossian being the only figure that strikes the eye. He disappears at the touch of an invisible string, spring and you're introduced to a most elegant room adorned in the most improved style of modern art. I conceive that both these apartments are meant as emblematic of the ancient and modern times. But I had too little time upon the spot and too much subject for thought to endeavor to trace the justness of the idea by observing the ornaments more particularly. Writing from Perth to her sister at Margate on the 27th of May, the following the wedding, Diggle reported that Miss Sai is married and was now as Mrs. B en route for London. Presumably that's uh, Grizzle Stewart, now Mrs. Buckle. We were really happy at Merthley, she writes, but it must be dull now for the graces M, and G and H are flown. They were shortly returned to, to return to Merthley, however, on the um, invitation of Sir John Stewart, because having suffered a bout of ill health, she decided to use it as a base for making gentle excursions to Schoon Palace, Castle Duplin and Dunkeld while she convalesced. After her recovery, the tourists decided to tack on a new tour to her old one and go further north, or as she put it, making the long tour instead of the short. And notice how tourists themselves are using the, the, the nomenclature here to, to classify the kinds of tour, the long or the, the short tour. Um, and the, the long tour, tour in this case was up to Inverness via Aberdeen, hiring horses at Perth for a month with a view to return to Edinburgh in time for the races on the 21st of July. However, a second bout of ill health demanded a redrawing of plans as an Aberdeen doctor recommended that Diggle rest for a few more days after which they returned again to Merthley. Clearly, ill health didn't affect her appetite, however, as she reported dining in Cooper on fine salmon, roast chicken, spinach, and a great gooseberry tart, wine, beer, etc., for two shillings, 11 pence. And a few, a few days later at Montrose on two boiled chicks, a pigeon pie, asparagus, partons, an epern of nice sweetmeats for one shilling and four pence. So the food was delicious and it wasn't expensive for many English visitors in this period. Deciding instead to follow the course of the petty tour through the Bredalbon Argyle estates, Diggle and her aunt were joined, quote, for fear of the bad roads by a man called Mr. S, a redoubtable local Perthshire worthy, Robert Stewart of Garth. Fair Garst, to give his Gallic title, was a recently widowed Highland chieftain of the old stamp to whom they'd been introduced at Merthley where he, when he was accompanied by his 20 year old son, David, an ensign in the Black Watch. Got a slight hunch he had a romantic interest in Elizabeth Diggle, but I can't be sure. Um, so his 21 year old, his 20 year old son, David, whom she met, uh, later became General David Stewart, who you can see in this picture, uh, became a Napoleonic war hero, a friend, a friend of Sir Walter Scott, and author of the Sketches of the Highlanders of Scotland, 1822, in which he criticized the clearance policies of his fellow Highland landlords. Notwithstanding Stuart's uh, senior's local knowledge, Diggle's chase had a nasty accident on the road to Blair. Undeterred, after admiring the Duke of Athol's rhubarb plantations, and he was famous for planting rhubarb, not the same as our modern rhubarb, as you can see here from William, De William Delacour's uh, um, drawing of 1765, it was a kind of medicinal, medicinal rhubarb. Um, and she wrote, the rhubarb stays in the ground seven or eight years before it's fit to torment children with. Um, they continued on to Taymouth by Dunkeld, full of summer tourists who had come to drink goat's whey. In that period, goat, drinking goat's whey was a kind of health tourism for people with gout who drank too much um, red wine and ate too much red meat. Despite these uh, temporary inhabitants, i.e. the tourists, Diggle enthused, here we are in the heart of the Highlands. I am in quite in love with them and shall never like to live near London anymore. Yet Diggle also satirized the sort of picture-making descriptions that would sell multiple copies of Sarah Murray's companion just a decade later. The road from Dunkeld to Blair is very fine. Hills to the skies, no sign of living creatures, clouds halfway down the hills, river at bottom, rocks and woody banks, and for variety, a Highlander leading a cow to feed. Shake these well together and you produce a Highland scene 
according to the most approved receipts. It's a sort of, um, sort of uh, picturesque cocktail. In contrast to Dorothy Wordsworth, Diggle recorded few encounters with local people, and there are clear limits to her social empathy. Riding along the beautiful banks of Loch Tay, she observed, I quote, the Highlanders peeping out from their wretched huts with merry faces to stare at us and looked so happy I could not pity them for living in such places. Visit visiting the Acharn Her Hermitage near Kenmore in Loch Tay, she and her aunt were loaded onto a cart to climb the track up to the waterfall. For the chase, she, so, she wrote, could not be dragged up so steep a place. After admiring Inverary, well, she didn't say, she says less about Inverary than most tourists, surprisingly, they followed the military roads past the rest and be thankful and through Glen Crow, a most dreadful desert, she wrote, but whose mountains kept us perfectly shaded from a scorching sun. She was very lucky to get extremely good weather for the first, at least the first part of her uh, Scottish tour. She noted that here in Glen Crow, soldiers tense and liven the scene. The men are employed to mend the roads which were originally made and are still kept in repair by the military. Only two years later in 1790, military was replaced by civilian labor on the roads as the government disinvested in their upkeep, leading to a period of deterioration complained of by numerous travelers. Before things improved with Thomas Telford and the Roads and Bridges Act of 1803. Diggle and her party then put up in the Duke of Argyle's new inn at Arachar, which he praised as an excellent inn on the bank of Loch Long. And it had actually been built, it had been built as a, as a private home, house for the Laird of Macfarlane, but uh, the Duke of Argyle had bought it and uh, recently turned it into a rather um, um, upper crust uh, um, inn. And from here, they visited uh, Rosneath, the Gerloch and Loch Lomond before returning south to Glasgow. In Glasgow, she described her lodgings in the Tontine Inn in Argyle Street, um, quote, as big as a castle, and Glasgow is a bustle enough to frighten us poor Highlanders. Indeed, Glasgow was, quote, much more bustling than Edinburgh, and has a great many fine large houses in it. They duly visited the college and cathedral. They decided to occupy the time before the Edinburgh races on 21st July by returning to the new, new inn at Arica for a further 10 day stay, despite deteriorating weather. But in the meantime, they visited a Glasgow Inkle or ribbon factory, where Diggle was impressed by the machinery. One pool moves a great number of shuttles, weaving so many pieces of tape at the same instant, and the dexterity of the women and girl workers who fold the pieces of tape and bobbins into the neat forms we see them at the shops. The industrial theme, uh, reminding us of the 18th century tourists, that 18th century tourists visited sites of industrial improvement, manufactories, as well as beauty spots and historical monuments, is developed in her fine description of a visit to what she called the Dominion of Vulcan, the Karen Ironworks near Falkirk uh, in the letter of 26th of June. Heavens, we are escaped from the infernal regions, a whole town of smoke and fire and a thousand people at work, furnaces blazing on all sides, half seen through a black smoke, beings whose appearance I leave it to you to imagine, pouring liquid fire into cauldrons, hammering red hot irons, etc., and an engine working that absolutely overpowered me by a louder voice than ever I'd heard before. Imagine enough liquid fire poured into a mold to make a 36 pounder, for they are now making a stock for the Empress of Russia. These pleasant abodes of destruction in embryo are planted around with cannon, furnaces, bells, grates, etc., etc., innumerables to cool and harden. So one of the one of Europe's biggest uh, munitions uh, arms factories situated at Caron in this period. And I love it. I think it's an amazing description. Proceeding to Stirling, and this is a lovely um, uh, painting we uh, discovered by Turner of Stirling, um, of Stirling Castle, viewed from an industrial, from a quarry site in the foreground. It's an extraordinary um, picture in the, in the collection of Glasgow Life. And at Stirling, they were relieved by contrast from Karen with the final, which he called the finest prospect in Europe, viewed from the, 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 the esplanade of the castle, before traveling west again towards Argyle and Loch Long. Unfortunately, all their plans were scuppered when upon arrival at Arica, it turned out they hadn't received the innkeeper's letter informing them that the inn was fully booked. And so we had nothing to do, she wrote, but to come back again to Glasgow and decide 
what we should do with ourselves. At this point, Diggle resolved to abandon her final fortnight in Scotland and the Edinburgh races and return to uh, England post haste uh, via Dumfries and Moffat. This meant separating from their traveling companion, Mr. Stuart of Garth, whom she referred to as our beau, who left them, she wrote, to go prowling to Mull. Armed with souvenir gifts for her family, a set of Highland costume dolls from Perth, toothpicks of broom, some oars and ceramic bowls, she set off on the homeward journey. The final section of um, Diggle's uh, journal describes visiting um, the uh, Falls of Clyde, uh, Hamilton Palace, the Falls of Clyde, which you can see here in Jacob Moore's wonderful painting, um, and the magnificent but miserably neglected palace-like house of Drumlanrig, the Duke of Queensbury's, who, had visit, who has visited it but twice. The furniture and everything about it appears um, at, at least a uh, hundred years old. It's a wonderful image from by, Sand, by Paul Sandby. Their last view of Scotland uh, was at the inn of Gretna Green, for the, as she put it, for the reception of future matrimonial pairs, which is an appropriate closing note for a tour that was planned around a wedding, albeit of a more respectable kind. Crossing the border uh, to Carlisle on um, 7th of July, Diggle closed the Scottish section of her tour with the memorable words, we have now bid adieu to Scotland, oat cake and naked feet. All the world is traveling to Scotland or Ireland. 